good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Geisels, and I, I'm your host. Uh, this is a little bit unplanned. Um, the web page of Sophie said that Katya uh, Smetanina was going to host this, but Katya sent a message at 4 a.m. this morning uh, from the hospital saying that she went earlier than expected uh, in labor and uh, she has her first baby. Congratulations, uh, Katya, uh, wonderful. Uh, we are delighted and looking forward to see you soon. Uh, so I am uh, basically, I jumped in on short notice and am utterly unprepared, but uh, the good news is that uh, our first speaker is a person that uh, is the best prepared because this is uh, our first speaker is Andrew Patton who ran this series uh, the Sophie seminar series last year for an entire year all by himself bi-weekly um, now we have we wanted to keep this uh, webinar series uh, running because I thought we thought that it was a, a great service to the society and uh, we really are grateful to uh, Andrew who uh, took the initiative of starting this uh, series. Uh, but we have changed a little bit the format. Uh, we have now a team uh, besides uh, Katya and myself, uh, uh, Brian Kelly and Dashiang Xu are joining us uh, as uh, co-hosts. Um, and we are not running it bi-weekly, but rather uh, once a month. And uh, there, when you will visit uh, the webpage of Sophie, you will find the information. There are already a number of uh, webinars scheduled, and I will actually also share with you uh, the information uh, after the talk. So as I said, um, it's my great pleasure to have Andrew Patton uh, today. He is um, a professor of economics and a professor of finance at, uh, he's kind of a neighbor, um, not far from UNC Chapel Hill, 12 miles roughly. Uh, and the discussant is uh, uh, my friend uh, Alan Timmerman from San Diego. He's not 12 miles uh, close. He's much farther away on the other side of the, and he woke up early this morning. Um, Andrew, it's all yours. You have a very interesting title. <laughs> I don't think you are the devil, <laughs> uh, but uh, please go ahead. Uh, you have about uh, 40 minutes or so and uh, then we'll, we'll follow by the discussion. Uh, one final thing is that if you have uh, questions, uh, please write them in the chat and uh, we will uh, cover those uh, as we go. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Eric. Can you see this, the slides okay? I can. Great, thank you. Well, thanks very much to the, to the new organizers of the, the Sophie Seminar Series for the invitation. Uh, it's a little weird to be on the other side of the, the Zoom screen, but I'm, I'm very happy to be, to be part of the series. Um, okay, so this is um, joint work with uh, my longtime co-author, Dong Wan O, who's at the Federal Reserve Board, and because he's at the board, I have this uh, disclaimer down the bottom of the slide. So this is a, a new paper we've been working on for about a year, but this is the first chance we've had to present it. So there's plenty of, I'm sure, plenty of things to comment on, and I would welcome any feedback you would have. I'm very grateful to have Alan as the discussant. I'm sure I'm going to have tons of uh, things to work on starting tomorrow. So let me get into the, to the paper. So the motivation for this paper is thinking about the fact that there are many economic decisions that are made on a on the basis of a model with input from a model that's known to be good but imperfect. So it's good enough that you trust the model to inform your decision, but it's also well studied enough to know that it's not perfect. There are flaws, it's misspecified. So why would such a model be, be retained? Well, I, I think a main motivation for keeping a good but imperfect model is that it's well understood, it's well studied. So if you have a high stakes decision that needs to be made, do you use a model that is known inside out including its flaws, or do you swap it for the latest, greatest uh, improvement, which the authors have shown you is statistically better, but which is still not as quite well understood. There may also be institutional impediments to adopting a brand new model. It could be that this model is embedded in um, research programs or oversight committees or other investment uh, committee plans where it's not trivial to swap from one model to the next one day by day. 
So it may be that these models are updated periodically. So the good news is, as econometricians, it's not like we stop at the first model that anyone ever proposes and we're stuck with it, but they're not swapped every day. They're swapped when enough momentum and enough analysis has been done of the new model. And a third reason would be if the competitive environment is such that uh, it moves too fast for a new model to be implemented uh, quickly. And I'm, here I'm thinking about algorithmic trading where models are literally burned onto the chip and then implemented in the trading algorithm. So swapping that out for a new model is a, is a big deal and it can't be done um, very quickly. And so what I'm trying to think about in this paper here is how do we do better from a given baseline model that's good enough to be embedded in a decision-making process, but is known to be imperfect. And the real um, motivation for this, so this is the broad motivation, the specific motivation, the thing that got me thinking about this problem in the first place, was the pandemic. So this is secretly a pandemic paper, but I'm not going to talk about the pandemic after this slide, uh, these couple of motivation slides. So like everyone, I was looking at volatility through the first quarter, second quarter of 2020. And this is a plot of annualized volatility from a Gartuan 1 uh, through 2020. You can see it spikes up to about 50% the flash crash level right around the beginning of March. And then through the first couple of weeks of, of March, it gets up as high as just above actually Black Monday 987. So this, this here is Monday night, Monday, March 16. Volatility crossed Black Monday 987. It was the highest it had been in the sample I was studying, which was 30 plus years. Which was, you know, this is a lot of volatility. And at that point, I was sort of doing day by day or sort of evening by evening updates of where's volatility at today. And it was creeping, creeping, creeping up. And when it got to this and it crossed Black Monday 987, I did the analysis of how much, how long is it going to take to get back to normal? How long do we have to wait before things get sort of calm again? So I did like a multi-step ahead forecast from this Garch 1-1, and this is this purple line that comes down. So the Garch 1-1 is stationary, it does mean revert, but the degree of persistence in the model suggested that it wasn't gonna be back to normal till way off till like end of the year. It was gonna take months and months and months before volatility was even as low as and the flash crash, 50% annualized. So I shared this forecast with some friends and some colleagues, including a particular colleague who knows the Garch 1-1 very well, and what I got was, was an optimistic response, which is that, well, volatility is probably gonna come down faster than the model predicts. And I don't think it was just optimism. What it was, was people understanding the model and its flaws, and also understanding um, extensions of this model. So there've been extensions of the Gartron one. I mean, there's been hundreds. One of them is one that has two components. It has a fast and a slow moving component. And the spikes in volatility tend to be driven by the fast moving component, which by definition is quickly mean reverting. There are other um, models that have been proposed that look at continuous versus jump volatility. Jump volatility tends to generate spikes like this one. And jump volatility has been found empirically to be very short lived. It's not very predictable, not very persistent. And so for these and other reasons, people were sort of saying, the feedback I got, volatility is probably gonna come down faster than, than the model predicts. And indeed it did. So in green here, what I'm plotting is the fitted, but now out of sample uh, volatility from the Garch 1-1. And you can see it came down almost as quickly as it went up. It was only six weeks until it was back down to its average level. And then it sort of bounced around the average level for the rest of the year. So it was true, this collective wisdom that people had about the Garch 1-1 and how it behaves, in particular, in this example, when volatility is really high, um, was, was correct. So what we're trying to do in this paper is to formalize this idea. And the way we're gonna, it was the idea of bringing this uh, knowledge we have about models that are good but misspecified to improve the, the forecast from those models. So we're going to think about drawing on information from a state variable. I'm going to talk about how we pick those later. That's informative about the misspecification of the model. For example, the state variable for in the previous example was the level of volatility. So when Garch volatility is high, we think we know that it will mean revert faster than the model um, suggests. And in other applications, there will be other types of state variables. And so what I'm assuming here is that if a model is well-known, well-loved enough to be embedded in a decision-making process, then it's also well-studied enough that the people who use it or are responsible for maintaining it uh, have an idea of what are the variables you need to keep track of when looking at the output from this model? What are the state variables that might be correlated with its misspecification? 
So we're going to tilt the parameters by drawing on information from this type of state variable using a, a local estimation. So we're going to think about local M estimation, and that nests local OLS, local MLE. It's also related to um, exponential smoothing. So I'm going to think about conditioning on um, stochastic state variables, like the level of volatility or the slope of the yield curve or other things. But you could also condition on time, in which case, um, thinking about variables that are related in time, it basically boils down to downweighting uh, older information. This comes to like exponential smoothing and other things like that. But what we're going to keep fixed here, this is a constrained optimization problem. The constraint is you can't deviate from the baseline model. That model is, is locked into the process, but you can adjust its parameters. Okay, so we're going to think about local MS estimation I just mentioned. So methodologically, we're not doing anything new here. This is sort of pulling tools from the stats literature to, to address this problem. We're going to think about how local MS estimation compares with non-local sort of benchmark parametric estimation uh, in out-of-sample forecasting. We're going to find a, a pretty standard bias variance trade-off, and that'll give us predictions for when a local estimation method is likely to work well and when it's not likely to work well. And here I'm sort of summarizing it. Um, it's not going to work very well if the baseline model is too good or if the state variable is too bad. And I will formalize exactly what I mean by that um, in, later. So I'm going to talk what that means specifically. And then I'm going to apply this method to four quite distinct economic forecasting problems. And I'm going to show you that we get um, statistically significant improvements in forecast over the baseline methods in almost all cases. And it's not all. I would like it to be all, it's not quite all, and it's uh, we lose where the theory predicts we lose. And I'll, I'll show you exactly those um, later. Okay, so we relate to local estimation. I'm gonna sort of flash up the papers that we're sort of most closely related to. Local estimation when we condition on state variables, smoothly varying parameters if we condition on time. And then we also think, more broadly to the idea of bringing in outside information to improve forecasts from parametric models. And there's a, a few examples of papers uh, down here, including one by Alan uh, that discuss it today. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to now talking about local estimation of forecasting models and then get into this bias variance trade-off. And then I'll show you some applications I'm already predicting I, I won't be able to show you the HAR application, even though the results there are actually very strong. Um, so I'm going to show you the Garch and maybe, I hope the last two. So Garch and, and the last two. Okay, so, so a little bit of notation and setup here. So we're thinking about a target variable yt plus one uh, with some target functional g dagger. So a little bit of uh, details here. So the target variable can be a scalar or a vector. And the target functional can also be a scalar or a vector. And the dimensions don't have to match. So for example, one of our applications will be yt plus one is one period ahead returns on the SP500 index. And g will be the pair value at risk and expected shortfall. So it'll be two target variables. A more standard application will be our yield curve application. We're going to have 12 points on the yield curve and our target functional will be the mean of each of those points. So the, the variable and its mean, of course, the same dimension. But it could be anything else that is elicitable. So we're going to think about any target functional which can be elicited by minimizing the expected loss. So this is the definition of elicitability. So our functional is the thing that solves this minimization problem over here. And a functional is said to be elicitable if there exists a loss function such that it's the solution to this problem. So this includes mean, median, any quantile, date, risk, and expected shortfall as a pair, and a whole bunch of other things. We're going to have our baseline model is some parametric model for the target functional. So I'm going to, it's some function of forecast variables xt and a finite dimensional parameter theta. And I'm just going to call that thing g sub t of theta. And importantly, this uh, model may or may not be correctly specified. Now, it'll only be correctly specified in sort of uh, extreme cases, which I'll use to illustrate uh, where things work and don't work. But so our, our target which is unobservable is g dagger. Our model is g of theta. And what we're talking about in this paper is how to get better estimates of theta. So in the baseline model, we're gonna assume is estimated by sort of standard M estimation. So given that you have a loss function, which elicits the target functional g, 
the obvious thing to do is to minimize that loss function to get the best parameter estimate or one definition of the best parameter estimate. Given that this is a finite dimensional parameter, parametric estimation, under standard conditions, this thing has a well-defined probability limit. I'll call that theta hat star. I'm keeping the hat here because I'm going to have another version, another type of estimator, which I'll call theta tilde. And so when it's an estimate, I'll give it a sub t. If it's the population value, I'll give it a star. So it has uh, this probability limit and it converges at rate root t, usually to a, a normal distribution. Now, what I'm going to use later is not the limiting distribution. What I really want from this third bullet point here is the rates. So this is converging at rate root t, the standard parametric rate. And we're going to contrast estimation uh, in sort of non-local, uh, a non-local fashion with local estimation, which I'm going to talk about um, here. So when we do local estimation, I'm going to describe it for the case that we have a stochastic state variable. That's sort of the main example uh, I want to focus on in this paper, though, I, as I said, we'll also talk about conditioning on time. So the state variable I call S, because this is a variable that's going to tilt the forecast from the, the model, it has to be known at the time the forecast is made, so it has to be FT measurable, and it may or may not be included in the baseline model. So it might be a variable that's in, already in the model, but the model's linear, and including it as a state variable is effectively going to make it non-linear, or it could be just another piece of information that's not in the model, but maybe it should be. We're going to consider this uh, type of local estimator, where it looks just like the previous um, estimator, except that we weight the loss function at each point in time t by how close uh, the previous observation is in the metric of the state variable s. So I'm going to have at some point in the support of the state variable little s, I'm going to measure how close is observation t minus 1 to that target uh, value, little s. And I'm using the lag value because I'm forecasting y uh, sub t. So here, just to clarify notation issue, I'm going to assume that our sample runs from little t equals 0 to cap t, the one step ahead forecasting problem. So rather than carry around cap t minus 1 sort of everywhere, I'm just going to define period 0 as being available as well. Uh, so this is a weight function. If the weights were all equal to 1, this would uh, reduce to non-local estimation that was on the previous slide. Of course, we're going to have the weights not generally be flat. We use some kernel to, to weight the old observations. Kernel has a bandwidth parameter, which is going to go to zero. And a variety of regularity conditions, and uh, a leading example of this is the Annals of Stats paper by Fan et al. Uh, this will have a well-defined probability limit. I'll call this thing theta tilde star. And it's the solution to this conditional optimization problem. So it's maximizing the conditional loss, sorry, it's minimizing the conditional loss, maximizing the conditional likelihood uh, of yt plus one, given the state variable the previous period. Then with the bandwidth parameter shrinking at just the right rate or at an appropriate rate, this estimator satisfies uh, this last equation down here. And the key thing to get out uh, from this last line here, again, I don't, I'm not gonna need the limiting distribution for what I wanna talk about next. All I really need is the rate. And the rate is going to be somewhere between um, t to a tiny number and t to a number less than half. So this gamma here is between zero and a half, telling us that the estimator is consistent, but slower than parametric. And that's all I really wanted to get here. So this is why I'm not getting too detailed about the regularity conditions. The right um, choice of bandwidth is really important. Theoretically, it depends on the smoothness of the function we're approximating, the degree of serial dependence in the data, Whatever that rate is, what we're going to have down the bottom here is an estimator that's converging slower than parametric. And that's the key that I'm going to use in a moment. When we come to the empirical uh, analysis, we're going to do cross-validation to pick the bandwidth parameter. So it's a very important problem. It's just I'm going to delay talking about that until we get to the empirics. So we have these two ways of estimating the parameter. One is non-local, so you just get some estimate. And it's flat, it's fixed. We have a local estimate, which varies with the state variable S. So let me talk about a couple of properties of this estimation method and then get into um, the bias variance trade off. So, if the baseline model is correctly specified, then the parametric model, there is a parameter such that when you plug in that parameter to your model, it gives you the true target functional G dagger. This is the definition of a parametric model being correctly specified in this application. This implies that the conditional expected loss of the parametric model evaluated at the true parameter 
is better than any other choice. And by the law of iterate expectations, because the state variable is FT measurable, we get this uh, star equation uh, here. The local estimator, its optimization problem implies the spade equation uh, in the second to last line here. But the only way these two equations can, can simultaneously hold is if the local estimator is equal to the non-local estimator, which implies that the local estimator is flat in the state variable. We can even make that a slightly stronger statement. We can say, we can show using the same logic that if the baseline model is correctly specified, then there doesn't exist a state variable that's informative, that any state variable you choose in population will lead to a, a local estimator that's flat in that state variable. So I'm going to use this result in a moment. This is sort of what you would expect. If the model is correct, then telling the model that, hey, you're in a high volatility state or the yield curve is inverted doesn't change the prediction from the model because the model already knows that. If it's relevant, it's already known. It's already in the model. So let me talk about a bias variance trade-off, local versus non-local. This is a standard way to approach the problem. No big tricks here. I'm going to evaluate the loss in the first period out of sample, y cap t plus 1, evaluated at the estimated local parameter, theta tilde sub t. I'm going to expand that around the population pr local parameter, theta tilde star. And then we have the first order term and the second order term, and the third and higher order terms will assume vanish fast enough to be ignored. So the things on this slide, so we have the loss that you actually incur at time t plus one using the estimated parameters. This one on the right-hand side is what you would incur if you could somehow get the population parameter. The linear term drops out from the first order condition from the local estimation problem, the population version of that. So this sort of second line here goes away. And the third line is the line that captures the impact of estimation error. We have a Hessian-like term uh, down here, the second derivative of the loss function. We're gonna take expectations in a moment. This is gonna be like a Hessian. And then we have the squared estimation error of the local estimator. And this is where the rate kicks in. So the rate of this term is t to the uh, minus one plus two gamma. This is a square, so it's of course um, weakly positive. This is a Hessian type term. The second derivative is, is positive um, in expectation for all loss functions I've looked at. So this is also known to be positive. So we have the loss using estimated parameters is equal to the loss using population parameters, plus essentially a cost from estimation error. We get the same for the usual estimator. And the only thing that differs, or the thing I'd like you to, uh, to note is that the estimation error in the parametric case, the baseline model is order t to the minus one, so it's going way faster because it's squared. So the root t becomes t. So when we take expectations and take the difference between the loss from using the local estimator and the loss from using the the non-local, the benchmark estimator, we get um, this. So in the first line, I have the actual loss in population. So having a very long out of sample period, the actual difference in out of sample losses from using the local versus the non-local estimated parameters is equal to the difference of those two methods using their population. And because the local estimator nests the non-local, this loss has, this term has to be weakly negative. So when we use a more flexible model, we allow the parameters to vary with some state variable. This thing is, is weakly negative. The third term, though, is positive, and it's dominated by the variance of the local estimator. This is where the difference in the rate matters. So this, this last term is a penalty or a cost of having estimation error. The increased variance in the estimation error leads to the presence of this term. So a pretty sort of standard looking sort of bias variance trade-off. What does this um, predict? What does this allow us to do? It allows us to, to figure out when local methods will work or not work. I'm going to have just two predictions from this. The first case, what happens if the baseline model is correctly specified? Well, we already showed that in that case, the local estimator population parameter is flat in S, which means that, of course, it has exactly the same expected loss as the non-local estimator. There's no improvement in fit. There is only a, a deterioration in uh, finite sample fit from the increased estimation error. And so when there's a correctly specified model, estimating locally, which is a non type of non-parametric estimation, is of course a bad idea. You should estimate parametrically. More generally, this tells us that if the baseline model is really good, then there's less scope for improving using a local estimation method. And there's more chance that what little improvement is left to perhaps be scooped up is over overwhelmed by the increased estimation error. 
So this is what I mean by the baseline model can't be too good or we're gonna be stuck uh, in this situation. What about the other case where non-local is gonna uh, do better is if we have a bad state variable. And so by bad state variable, what I specifically mean is what I've written here in red. A bad, a bad state variable is one which is mean independent of the scores of the non-local uh, model. So this derivative of L evaluated theta hat star, this is the non-local estimator in population. If these derivatives here, so I'm calling them scores in the likelihood case, are uh, mean independent of S, then the local estimation problem, its first order condition will be satisfied at the non-local parameter. So this right-hand side of the equation here is equal to zero by the first order condition for non-local estimation. The left-hand side is the first order condition for local estimation. And if that's also equal to zero when evaluated theta hat star, then we're done. What we've sort of shown here is that if you have a really bad state variable, we'll have a local parameter that's again flat in S, but from a different source. It's not because the model's good, it's because you've got a really poor state variable. And so of course, more generally, what this means is that if we have a pretty bad state variable, we're gonna have almost flat uh, parameters as a function of S, and that's gonna lead to less chance to improve uh, over the baseline model and more, more chance of being overwhelmed by estimation. Okay. Let me briefly show you a, a little example and then I'll get on to the empirical applications. So this is an example of a nonlinear AR1. And because I've worked with copulas in the past, I chose to do a copula based one. So this is an example where yt and yt minus one follow a nonlinear uh, structure driven by some Clayton copula with standard normal margins. I'm going to fix the Clayton copula parameter so it has linear order correlation of about 0.85. And my baseline model is going to be an AR1. And let me show you what happens in this case with linear and local. So non-local and local is done. So the gray dots here are a sample of data from this process. And the pink line here is the true conditional expectation function of yt given yt minus one. So you can see it has a slope of almost one for low values of yt minus one, and has a slope of almost zero for large values. When you use OLS, to fit that linear model, you get the best linear approximation to the pink line. And that's what this one looks like. If you do local OLS, which in this case is the, the local M estimation, using the lag Y as a state variable, it happens in this example to almost completely recover the true structure. This is a, a special case where local estimation can in fact overcome completely model misspecification. This is like the opposite of the previous slide where I had a terrible state variable. This is like the perfect state variable, but this won't happen in general. This is just an example. If we consider a second type of local estimation, this is using the second lag of Y. So in this case, the second lag of Y is a pretty good state variable. It's correlated with the best state variable, but it's not perfect. And in particular, it's not perfect where the correlation, the serial correlation of Y is, is weaker. And for this particular process, it's in the upper quadrant. Uh, both of these pictures here were selected. There's a bandwidth parameter here that needs to be picked. And I picked it by looking across a variety of choices for the bandwidth. And so what I'm showing you in this slide here is the relative root mean squared error relative to OLS. So OLS is fixed at one here. For the DGP, so the DGP is, is fixed also, it's about 0.93. So this means there's a 7% sort of gap that we might hope to beat OLS, but we can never beat, of course, the DGP. Local OLS for this sample size almost gets down as low as the DGP, and in the limit, it would actually get down to this pink line. Local OLS using the second lag, this is an imperfect state variable, it's never going to get down to the pink line. And you can see here that for good choices of the bandwidth, it does beat OLS, but for bad choices, and in this example, um, bad choices correspond to a too small a bandwidth, not enough information coming into the estimator, uh, the RMSE is above one. For both of these estimators, as the bandwidth goes off to infinity, the weight function becomes flat and they both converge or revert to being OLS. And so these blue and red lines, they all con converge to, to one. Get into um, the applications. So we're going to look at 20 years of data from 2000 to 2019. So that slide I showed you earlier with March 2020, I'm not looking, I'm not dealing with March 2020. I want to be out of the pandemic before I start looking at data from the pandemic for real. So we're going to finish in December 2019. The estimation sample is the first decade, and we're going to subcorrect that 
into further into two, the first five years we're gonna use for the training sample to estimate the parameters of the models. The last five years will be to find the optimal bandwidth parameters. And then the 10 years, 2010 to 2019, those are our out of sample period. And we don't touch that except for evaluating, comparing the forecasts. We're gonna consider time as a state variable. So we're gonna have like, well, I'll explain in a second, uh, a non, deterministic uh, state variable and then four stochastic state variables. We use realized volatility and VIX as two different measures of the level of volatility. And then we'll use the Fed funds rate and the 10 year minus two year treasury yield. So we have like a level and a slope um, state variable from the term structure. And then we'll also consider bivariate state variables where we use time and one of these other four. So this gives us a total of nine state variables that we're gonna think about. I'm going to sort of skip the kernel stuff. We used, we didn't really experiment much with this. We used Gaussian kernels for the stochastic state variables and exponential kernel for the time. It's nothing sort of tricky here. Uh, for non-local estimation, because rolling window is so well known, I wanted to uh, keep that keep a variety of window lengths as competitors. If we can't beat rolling window, then we don't really have much to offer. And so we're going to think about rolling window estimation where the window lengths range from 250 to two and a half thousand. At the shorter end here, these are kind of local estimation, right? Like this is a rectangular kernel, one-sided, but I'm gonna call that a part of the baseline set, just because if we can't, as I said, if we can't be rolling window, then we're not, we're not adding much. And then to compare the forecast, we're gonna use Giacomini white tests to do pairwise comparisons and model confidence sets to compare all the estimators jointly. So let me show you what we get. Okay, one more slide break show. So the first one we do, uh, we have the Garch model is our baseline. We're gonna have mean zero. We're gonna estimate and evaluate using the Q-like locks function, which is equivalent to minimizing, maximizing the normal likelihood. So this is all, all standard stuff. And these are the results. We have 13 methods in the set here. We have four different non-local methods for the four different window lengths. And then we have nine local methods. And the best non-local method here turns out to be ranked eighth. I've highlighted here in red. And that's the one we're gonna to use to do pairwise tests in the Giacomini white test. So this is making life even harder for us. I'm using the ex post best benchmark method as the competitor in the Giacomini white test. What we see, there's a bunch of um, local methods that significantly beat it. We have four significantly beat it, five almost, 1.91, but these four beat it with T stats of over six. So this is very, very strong. These are negative, so it indicates lower average loss in the out of sample period. And you can see the state variables that seem to matter here are ones that summarize the level of volatility, either through VIX or realized volatility, with or without time as an additional state variable. We see the best non-local method is not in the model confidence set. In fact, the model confidence set is very small. It only has one entry. It's the local method using VIX as the state variable. A question that I thought would come up and I wanted to address here is that, uh, is which local method would we have picked using the in-sample period? And so when we optimize the bandwidth parameter, we can also see across all the different state variables and bandwidth parameters, which one is the one that in sample, we would say this is the one we're taking out of sample. So in this case, it would have been one that uses time and realized volatility as the state variables. It comes in fourth, so ex post, it didn't turn out to be the best, but it did significantly beat the benchmark, T stat of six and a half. Just for reference, the sort of standard non-local estimate, which is to use all of the data you have, comes dead last. It's ranked 13th, significantly worse than using a shorter window of 500. And lastly, this is where I want to highlight a bad state variable. So for these volatility forecasting, this volatility forecasting application, these two yield curve state variables, the level and the slope, the Fed funds rate and 10 minus two year yields, lead to significantly higher out of sample losses. So this is one where it's not helping the fit and it's hurting with more estimation error. So this is a, in this application, a poor choice of state variable leading to worse, significantly worse out of sample performance. So I'm gonna skip the HAR application and I'll, I'll show you instead value at risk and expected shortfall and then the yield curve application. So we're moving to a totally different thing here. So 
Gartsch models are estimated by um, quasi-maximum likelihood. Here we're going to use um, M estimation, and we're going to have our target functional is now a vector. It's the vector value at risk and expected shortfall. I'm sure almost everyone here knows what these quantities are, but just to make sure. Value at risk at some probability level alpha, which is usually set at 5%, is just the, uh, the alpha quantile of the conditional distribution, which I'm calling here F or FT. So it's just a, a quantile. Expected shortfall is the expected value of that random variable given the information set and also given that it's below its value at risk. So it's the conditional on being below value at risk what's the expected value of that random variable. It's been known for a while that expected shortfall, whilst it has some desirable property as a measure of risk, is has a very undesirable statistical property in that it's not elicitable. It can't be elicited uh, directly. That means it can't be estimated without other assumptions or other parts in the model. Uh, what this nice paper by Fistler and Ziegel show, this came out a few years ago, uh, is that it can be elicited jointly with value at risk. And they propose a class of loss functions that allow these to be uh, extracted as a pair. We're going to use the, the so-called FZ, FZ0 uh, loss function, which has this weird looking functional uh, form. And when we minimize the FZ0 loss function, we get value at risk expected short. OK, so now that's going to be our loss function for estimation and for uh, forecast comparison. The so value risk and expected shortfall forecast. And value risk forecasting has been around for a long time, 25-ish years. And but expected shortfall is relatively new. And so I, I wasn't sure what is the benchmark model here. So I'm going to have a, a few more baseline models. Uh, the first one is a, a normal GARCH. We have a GARCH 1-1, as in the previous application, augmented with a specific assumption for the shocks. And the, the assumption is that those shocks are standard normal, which leads to the value risk and expected shortfall following this equation here. This is the the alpha quantile of a normal distribution, and this is the alpha expected shortfall, which happens to have this nice closed form expression. But I thought that might be too weak of a benchmark. We kind of know normal approximations for the distribution of the shocks is poor. So I'm going to have another benchmark which allows these to be uh, estimated from the empirical distribution of the standardized residuals, and I'll call this the EDF GARCH model. That has the same dynamics coming from the GARCH uh, model for standard deviation but the estimated value risk and expected shortfall are different, reflecting the fatter tails of stock return. And then for uh, as additional baseline models, I'm going to take two models from a paper I wrote with Johannes Eagle and a former student of mine, uh, Rui Chen. These are gas type models for value risk and expected shortfall, so generalized order regressive score models. Uh, we have the two factor gas model, which is like the obvious well, after pages of algebra, the model that plops out using a gas structure on this FZ0 loss function. It has this uh, functional form up top there. And then what we found in that paper was that this is over-parameterized for these two rather correlated tail quantities. And we found a one-factor gas model uh, to work better. So I'm going to consider that one as well. So this has a total of 52 methods being compared. I have four baseline models estimated on four uh, fixed window lengths. And then we have nine state variables. So we have 52 in total. I'm just going to show you a, snips, a snapshot of the top of this list and the bottom of this list. So this is the top of the list going from one, and I had to skip a few rows here, down to 17. So the best, the ex post best local estimator is ranked 17th out of 52. It turns out to be the one factor model that um, is from this um, paper with Johanna and Rui using as long a window as you can. So these are tail measures of risk. They're in the 5% tail. Consistent with that, you kind of want to have a lot of data. And so the best non-local method is this uh, one factor model estimated on 10 years of data. But it is beaten by 16 uh, local methods, many of them significantly. The model confidence set includes a total of 12. And importantly, uh, that model confidence set includes three out of the four um, models we would have picked from the in-sample period. So in that in-sample period, the best um, EDF GARCH model was one that used time and VIX as a state variable. And that turned out to be the best ex post as well. And then we have these other ones down here. The one that did the least well is the two-factor model, which consistent with what I mentioned just before, is probably over-parameterized for this, for this problem. The bottom of this table 
is not very surprising. Um, the worst ones are the biggest models estimated on the smallest sample sizes. They tend to do badly. This is, this is um, not a huge surprise. And now I guess in the last few minutes, I'll show you um, the application to yield curve forecast. So we're gonna think about the dynamic Nelson Siegel model that was proposed by Diebold and Lee. So this is another very widely used model. Many extensions have been proposed as well, but this is a model that's um, embedded in a lot of people's way of thinking about the term structure. To summarize exactly what this model is, they take the Nelson and Siegel model for a term structure of yield. So this is a cross-sectional model where we have yields on day T with maturity tau having some shape and the shape is go governed by three betas, essentially level, slope and curvature. And a fourth parameter lambda, which determines um, where the curve or where the turning point in the curvature um, occurs. So these parameters can be estimated. If you fix lambda, you can estimate the betas using RLS. If you don't want to fix lambda, you can estimate by nonlinear least squares. We're going to follow D and Lee and fix lambda. They fix it so that the turning point is about 30, a, a maturity of 30 months. This is, I think, standard in this literature. And what Diebold and Lee suggested is to estimate the betas uh, each month or each day, and then build a simple time series model to get a predicted beta for the next period. And their preferred model was a simple AR1, separate AR1 for each of the three betas. And then we insert our predicted betas back into a Nelson Siegel model, we get a predicted yield curve for the next period. So we're going to do a local version of this dynamic Nelson Siegel model where the AR1 models are estimated by local OLS. And we're going to do the same state very well and same bandwidth, of course, for all three AR1s. We have recently thought about relaxing that, but we haven't done it. It could be done, but we haven't. We have, you could have a different local model for the level, slope, and curvature terms, but, but we're not going to do that. Uh, we look at 12 maturities ranging from three months to 10 years. I'm going to summarize the overall fit of the model by just simply adding the square forecast errors across all maturity. And we're gonna show you results different from the earlier uh, examples for one day and 20 day forecast horizons. So this is the one day horizon. And this is, um, this is the bad slide for us. This is one where the best non-local method comes first. So the best ex post best local method uses a window length of 500 and it beats everything, everything else. Not so good for us. The one we would have picked in sample is one that uses RV as realized volatility as our state variable. It comes second last and has a T stat of over four in the wrong direction in terms of how well it fits out of sample. So local method doing very badly at the one day horizon, very badly. Before I think about why that is the case, let me just say one other thing. So the model confidence set here includes five methods in total, the best one and four other ones. And the one thing I, I take away from what's in the model confidence set is that they're all models that downweight old observations. They're either non-local uh, methods with short windows or local methods that have time as one of the state variables. So why do we do so badly with this um, in this application? Why, why are we looking so terrible here? The reason we're doing so badly is that this baseline model is too good. It's too good to be helped much by a new estimation method. The in-sample R squared of this uh, model is 96.4%. And so this just doesn't leave enough of a crack for us to beat it using local type methods. And I'll note here that all of the other methods have an in-sample R squared of exactly 0.964% as well. Like this just, we just can't beat this baseline model. It's too close to, to being perfect. I'm not saying it is perfect, it's just really close. And so it doesn't leave enough for us to, to improve on it. When we move to the 20 day horizon, this is a harder forecasting problem. We're forecasting not tomorrow, forecasting basically a month out. So now you can imagine any given model is gonna be worse and there might be some room there to, to beat uh, a specific baseline model. So in this case, the best non-local method is ranked seven. It's right in the middle of this um, set of models and all six local methods that beat it, beat it significantly. So the T stats here are all minus two and less. This is all significant improvement in fit relative to the ex post best local method. And the one we would have picked using the in sample period, I've highlighted again here in blue, if we just did a pairwise comparison with this as our, our local method to take out of sample, we would have a T stat of minus four. So again, significant evidence here in this more difficult forecasting problem, absent in the previous one. 
now I'm probably out of time, so let me just give you this one slide summary. So what we propose here is local estimation to try to get better forecasts from a misspecified model. And the motivation is that in a lot of real world economic decision making uh, environments, it's not trivial to swap your favorite existing model for the latest greatest uh, competitor. We compare the out of sample forecasts from a local and a non-local um, estimation method, and we get predictions of when um, local methods are likely to work. And in these four different economic forecasting applications, we get significant improvements in almost all, all cases. And I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Perfect timing. Uh, and the discussant is uh, Alan. Alan, it's all yours. Uh, you can share your screen. Uh, you're muted, Alan. There we go. Yeah, no, for some reason, uh, let's, yeah, let's share my screen now. There we go. All right. Okay, unmuted yep. and it's sharing my screen. Okay. okay. Yeah, thanks for the invitation to uh, discuss this very interesting uh, paper. It's always, uh, you know, uh, interesting to see a fresh new paper from, from Andrew's hands. It's always uh, well executed and uh, well thought through and uh, this is uh, a, uh, a you know a topic that also uh, is uh, one that I'm very interested in. Of course, with sort of like you know uh, time variation in predictability is related to you know structural breaks, uh, return predictability pockets, and uh, all sorts of, uh, of good things that uh, many of us are concerned with uh, uh, these days. So uh, I will spend most of my time, actually or all of my time talking about sort of like the methodology that's uh, that being proposed here and, and, and um, give some thoughts uh, on uh, also ways to, to implement some of the important uh, aspects of that. So just to summarize, and, and, and of course, you know, Andrew did a terrific job uh, summarizing very intuitively what's happening here, but just uh, to give you a brief uh, summary of it again. So the paper proposes this local M estimation approach uh, to improve the out of sample uh, accuracy of uh, some benchmark model that presumably has some degree of misspecification. As Andrew is saying, it can't be too good, right? Um, so the idea, uh, so you might ask, you know, of course, at first, hey, why not just simply replace this uh, model if it's misspecified, right? And come up with an even better one that nests it perhaps, right? But here the idea is that you know uh, forecasters have some experience with this uh, benchmark model, um, so they have some ability to identify some of these uh, state variables that are correlated with the uh, with the scores. Um, and so uh, you know, based on, on this oftentimes lengthy experience, for example, GAS one one models have been around since eighty six, so we certainly know you know, uh, when they're uh, likely to be misspecified and when they work very well and are very hard to beat, right? Um, and we can then exploit this uh, by coming up with some uh, state variables that importantly here are assumed to be observable. So they're you know, measurable with regard to some, some filtration and some information set here. And uh, they're used uh, through this uh, local kernel weighting scheme. Okay, uh, so you can think of it as in, in some way as sort of like intelligent tilting. So if I know ahead of time that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, uh, a crash is coming, so the car behind me is not slowing down when I'm slowing down on the freeway. There, you know, thanks, good. I better activate the uh, uh, the airbags, right? So I better sort of, uh, you know, uh, tilt uh, my forecast uh, in a way that hopefully is well informed through these uh, through these state variables. I think that's a very appealing uh, idea because I think it's actually underappreciated. I mean. If you're sitting there on the Federal Reserve Board and generating forecasts, and uh, you know they're going to be, uh, you know, broadcast to the to, to the nation and uh, influence, you know, interest rates and monetary policy throughout the world, you just don't go and change your forecasting models uh, and and come up with forecasts that you. I mean, people get it has a cost to changing your model and to change your forecasts. You lose credibility. So it's only something you can, uh, I mean, you, you can tilt your forecast, right? And you can in, interject a subjective element, but you can't just, you know, from one model, from, from one uh, quarter to the next, completely change the model. If you were to do so, then you really would lose uh, credibility. It's hard to explain uh, that to, to the broader public. So there's a, a constraint there, actually. 
which is sort of like you know better the devil you know that that's the that that's the setting uh, of it i don't know to the same extent if it holds in risk management or in finance i mean if you're jp morgan you probably don't want to change your value at risk model every month either right so there's some some truth to it uh, uh, as well i'm sure okay um but the key thing here really is that we will be able to identify these uh, state variables uh as uh, Andrew was saying, if they're not informative, they just introduce noise and uh, it's not going to help us. It's actually just going to or hurt us through the uh, greater estimation error. All right, so the setting, uh, I'll go through it very quickly. Um, so it's basically, yeah, we have these forecasts, these that are uh, G that uh, you know, are chosen to uh, minimize this conditionally expected uh, loss. And uh, you have the baseline model um, that just uses you know, standard uh, M estimation given a loss function. Um, to uh, you know, come up with these uh, you know, parameter estimates, theta hat uh, big T, and the alternative local estimator that uses these uh, kernel weights here uh, to come up with sort of a tilted or weighted uh, uh, estimate. And there the idea is uh, that it depends, the weights uh, sort of will depend on how uh, distant you are from some uh, target uh, S, which could, uh, you know, be the most recent uh, current state S capital T. If you're predicting out of sample, that would be natural, right? Or it could uh, be some other uh, target that is quite uh, flexible uh, really here. Okay, and then, you know, the theta uh, tildes HT that depend on, on the bandwidth, uh, the end of the sample, um, and they have uh, population equivalence theta tilde as to the full sample estimators and, uh, if you have a correct model specification, and only if you have that, or if uh, th then you will find that the forecast, the local forecasts, and the uh, sort of uh, global uh, forecast or the benchmark forecast will be identical across all the state variables uh, S. But outside that case, they will be different, right? Okay, and then you have this uh, gamma parameter that sort of uh, shows the degree to which the local estimator uh, converters or the parameters that converge more slowly than in the parametric benchmark uh, case. And then Andrew went through this really to show that, hey, there's this bias variance trade-off so that uh, you know, the uh, uh, local estimator that nests as a special case when the bandwidth parameter becomes very large, it nests the global uh, benchmark model. And so it has a smaller uh, bias, but it also has larger estimation error. And then you have to trade off those two components, which are regulated both through the bandwidth parameter and through your choice of uh, state variable S. So those are really the two uh, important uh, components, right? That's really what the, what the approach uh, brings to the table here through you know here the uh, uh the choice of the state variable and through this uh, bandwidth uh, parameter so those are the two things i'll be uh, spending my uh my time on, on on discussing yeah so first of all uh so the paper you know uses this local bias adjustment approach and i actually think that's uh that's uh sensible and and, and uh, uh also very interesting because if you look at i mean attempts at Sort of like a global bias adjustment. It's really hard. I mean, I have a paper with a former student of mine, Carlos Capistran, in Jebis, where we try to use this bias uh, adjustment method, uh, which you know goes in and, and sort of like projects uh, a forecast on an intercept and a you know uh, slope parameter, sort of in a Minza-Zanovich regression. So regress outcome on an intercept and the forecast, and then to the extent that the intercept is non-zero and the slope on the forecast is a uh, non-unity, then you can sort of do that bias adjustment. But it's really hard um, to make it uh, work uh, globally, right? Uh, we also try some, you know, common filter variations of it and so forth. And sometimes it works, but it's really hard to make it work uh, across the board for, for many different types of variables. So a more local bias adjustment approach is, is actually something, uh, a conditional approach uh, is something that I think uh, makes sense. And then a point that I had raised before, well, why not just replace the benchmark model if it's so misspecified and you know the direction in which it's misspecified, right? Sort of like a, you know, Andrew correctly referenced the gas models. That was my first thought as well, right? You know, the score is correlated with this information. Well, then go in and, and uh, account for that, right? Well, we already mentioned that it's not so simple to always to replace the legacy model. Um, and, uh, you know, you may uh, know how to choose these uh, state variables, ST, and I'll come back to that. Um, 
So it has some, some advantages the way it's being done here. But I would actually like you to maybe, I mean, since uh, Dong, I guess, is at the board, right? So it would be good to actually go and ask uh, people who come up with these green book forecasts. Is this a way to think? I mean, is it, uh, can you think about this, this so-called judgmental element in these central bank forecasts as being akin to sort of like over waiting period where you have financial crisis and, uh, you know, uh, uh, where the yield curve, uh, you know, uh, looks uh, a certain, has a certain shape, right? Because that would actually be interesting because we all know that these are not pure quantitative forecasts. Same thing with, you know, I'm sure the IMF and other international organizations. There's always a judgmental argument there, you know, sort of element in it. So maybe this, this is actually a very fruitful way of thinking about it. Okay, so Andrew uh, so showed, uh, I guess, four or five cases uh, in uh, all but one. This approach worked very well. Uh, on average, using a Giacomini white test. But actually, when I first started, uh, you know, reading the paper, I said, well, should you really set the bar that high in the sense that should you require that you, on average, beat uh, the uh, benchmark uh, model? So in other words, looking at sort of like the average, uh, the unconditional expected loss differential, so that on average, or some out of sample period, you uh, this this uh, you know local approach uh, beats the the global approach. Well, to the extent that the bias variance trade-off is conditional, and, and so the bias, you may actually know when the bias is likely to be very high, maybe in some states that are far away from the mean uh, value of some of the regressors, right? Then maybe you should just, it's good enough if you can identify ahead of time those periods where the benchmark is likely to be particularly misspecified, and then you can go in and overwrite this uh, benchmark model. So you say, most of the time I use the benchmark model, but then occasionally when I have particularly strong reason to believe that it's going to screw up, then I go in and, and use my tilted forecast, right? So even if you don't win on average, if you ex and can identify those states uh, in which your uh, local approach will work better, I think that's good enough. And actually, uh, you know, in some sense it's implied by this conditional var bias variance trade-off. So if you plotted the relative performance uh, of your forecasts uh, relative to the benchmark model against uh, you know, a measure of this conditional bias, then actually you should expect to see that you perform relatively better there. Uh, so it's like a conditional uh, Giacomini white test almost. Alan, right. sorry, sorry to interrupt, but can you wrap up in a couple of minutes? Just yes, I will indeed, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it's the source of model misspecification because your approach I think can also be uh, Used, you know, we all know how you know, how forecasting can be used uh, for as a way to evaluate models, right? Say something about the models misspecification. So, can you tell if the source of model misspecification time bearing is due to time bearing parameters or metered variables and nonlinearity? Well, we already mentioned this idea. You could augment the benchmark model through the state variables and maybe the cross product of state variables and any other predictors you may have there. Um, alternatively, if it's time bearing parameters, maybe it's a latent process and then it's actually not. It's, it's equivalent to having a state variable that's not observable, so it's not uh, in, in the filtration FT, right? So that's one way of, of, uh, of thinking about it. The other thing is, of course, once you have this ST, introduce new uh, state, uh, well, new issues, you know, what if it's high dimensional? You have up to two variables, I guess, in your uh, applications, but uh, you may have situations with, with more of them. And of course, since well, I'm discussing, I have to talk about forecast combination. You know me, that's, uh, I'm always big on that because I think it can be used here. So another alternative is of course, to weight the forecast based on the global model version and the uh, local model. But more interestingly, you know, since the bandwidth parameter is so key to your results, why not just uh, select a uh, range of bandwidth parameters? And then for each of these bandwidth parameters, generate forecasts and then come up with a weighted average. The forecast combination of that. Alternatively, if you want to get really creative, generate a separate forecasts for all for this range of you know the smallest bandwidth parameter to the highest bandwidth parameter. Generate your forecast and then uh, use them in your MCS. So you can rank them there, and then you, those that get retained uh, as a special case when when the bandwidth parameter is very large. That's the benchmark model, right? Uh, so that will automatically be considered as one of them. And then you do maybe, uh, well, you can con uh, contain them or you uh, in the MCS or you even combine them afterwards. And you can also do some conditional switching between them. But just, uh, you know, and, and so, so, so I think you can actually uh, deal with this uh, issue about bandwidth parameters uh, or choice of it uh, in, 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 in various uh, clever ways that should further robustify the approach. But I really like it and I think 
uh, it can also shed light on on how forecasts uh, you know should be tilted in, in in an optimal way, provided that you have good ways of selecting the state variable ST. Thank you. Uh, great discussion. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Andrew, we have a few minutes. Uh, we're running a bit late, but wh why don't you kind of share your thoughts on, on Alan's uh, comments? Well, let me first say thanks very much, Alan. This is really helpful things to think about. Um, we'll go away and we'll try a bunch of these ideas. I'll, maybe I'll talk on just uh, two of them. Uh, one was the conditional loss versus unconditional loss. And, and um, when I started this project, uh, we found that we could we could win on the conditional uh, out of sample loss metric much easier than the unconditional. As you said, it's like it's a lower hurdle to do the, the conditional. And so then I sort of retained the I want to win on the unconditional. That's the challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe you're right that maybe winning in just parts of the support of the state variable is an interesting thing to to note already. So maybe there's there's value in even documenting that that case. And so we have that, and that's an easier thing for the local methods to win at, but we haven't done that in a rigorous or systematic way yet. And I guess the other thing I, I, I would mention is the, including this, if you find a state variable that's useful, it is absolutely correct. Like, why not put it in the model? Like, why not try to fix the model using that state variable? And so we, we tried that a little bit. We, we, we're torn on how rigorously to answer that question in that the motivation for the paper is you're stuck with this pretty good, but not perfect baseline model. And if you throw in a new variable, it's no longer the baseline. But then again, um, for example, uh, in the Vol in the Garch case, we find like VIX or RV is a useful state variable. And I wanted to make sure we're not just rediscovering like the Garch X model where X is the volatility. So actually in the appendix to the paper, we do this whole local approach on Garch X as the baseline model to see with that new and better baseline model, can we still get some benefits from local? And in that particular case, we can, but what that's really revealing is that even the Garch X leaves, you know, some, some food on the plate that, that the local method can go and, and, and get. But, but um, those are all really helpful suggestions and, and we'll, we'll get working on it. Thank you, Andrew. We, uh, we're running out of time, and so I suggest that we will wrap up. This was a great start for year two of the uh, uh, SOFI seminar series. Um, uh, I'd like to announce that the next one will take place uh, on October 18th. It will be hosted by Dasheng Xiu, and it will uh, have uh, Jinjin Fan as uh, the speaker, and the discussant will be Torben Anderson. Uh, all the information is on uh, the SOFI webpage, uh, so please visit uh, the webpage for regular updates on this.